It is? Okay, very good. Okay, this uh, chapter manifesto or mission statement, uh, as we call it now, we think our, our former leader, Vito Carchetti, wrote this. Uh, Rich Patusi did an exhaustive search on the internet. We were thinking, okay, this, this came out of Britain where society started, or our national office, mm -hmm. I guess Jack Fiegel, our national president, had no idea. No idea. And Vito's been reading this for years, and you know we're, we're just so impressed, and I, I think all the chapters should be doing this because it really encapsulates what we're about. And for those who are attending for the first time, I think it's, uh, it's helpful to know why, why we're here. And that's how we start. Why are we here? Why are we Oriental Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox, Eastern Catholics, and Western Catholics, members of our chapter of the Society of St. John Chrysostom? First, because many of us, from deep within our beings, believe that the unity of the churches will come when the Holy Spirit wills it, and when the ordinary clergy and faithful raise a cry to their leaders for it. God bless our popes, patriarchs, bishops, and theologians who work on the issues that divide us, many of which are complicated and yet subtle. But here we are to express our desire and need for unity, to enable this desire and need to flow forth and encompass all Christians. While it is true that most Christians don't have church unity as a priority in their daily lives, we believe that those who do is increasing soul by soul and heart by heart across the world. And so we gather regularly to pray together, to eat together, to learn of each other's beliefs, customs, and traditions, and most of all, to get to know and love each other. When we do this, we believe that we are doing what Jesus asked us to do. So, yes, the society promotes Eastern Christianity, uh, the jewels of the church, as Pope uh, St. Pope John Paul once said. It's what makes the church Catholic, and when I use that small c, that means Orthodox Catholic, means universal. And, uh, yes, it's not well known in the West, but we, we need to keep doing what we're doing, and hopefully, by example, more and more people will come to the conclusion that we have so much more in common than what divides us. Thanks. Would you like to give us the reading of the uh, previous uh, meeting? Yes. Uh, I published the minutes uh, early this morning. Most of you should have them, so I'm not going to bore you going through them. We did have an executive committee meeting on May 8th, and we went over programs coming up, including this one. And our annual dinner, 20th anniversary, will be this year. And you'll be getting more information on all of these things as they come out. Some really interesting programs. Uh, in, um, I believe, September, we're going to have a panel of uh, presbyteros, or as we call them in the Arabic culture, khuridis. Uh And I'm forgetting uh, some of the Slavic terms. But these are the priest's wives. Matushkas. Okay. And, and for years, you know, just taken for granted, married, uh, you know, men becoming clergy, that the priest, he has a wife and she's free late <laughs> and they do all these things but today priest wives are modern women i know our chaplain's wife uh, i believe has an advanced degree uh, they met i believe at university father if i'm correct yeah seminary yes seminary. so i mean uh, things have have changed too and these women I, I know still help with the church but also have their own lives and careers so i think it's going to be very interesting that program to see what it is like being a priest's wife. And you know, we Eastern Catholics now have some married clergy as well. Uh, so that, that'll be very interesting. And then uh, you can look at the rest going on down, down the line. Uh, our 20th anniversary is coming up. Right now, I believe we're gonna be at St. Mark's, Father Rohan's church for that. We are, <coughs> surprise, surprise. We still have a lot of time, but our national president, uh, Jack Fiegel, will be uh, coming in. Okay. One piece of business that was transacted at the uh, executive board meeting was um, we gave $25 
to the Coptic nuns in Howland. We've been to their facility several times. If you haven't been out there recently, a big beautiful new church has gone up on that site. It's, it's amazing. Uh, Coptic Orthodox Church. They're, they're, from, they're from Egypt. And in fact, this, uh, this monastery, uh, or convent as you might say in the West, is the only one of, of uh, Orthodox Coptic nuns outside of Egypt. The only one in the world, I believe, is right here in Howe. And they've hosted us uh, several times. So we did, in response to their fundraiser, send $25 on behalf of the chapter. In return, they'll be praying for us. So we thought that was a good deal. To get uh, those kinds of prayers for just $25 is great. <clears throat> and then... Uh, at our last meeting, we were very privileged, regular meeting, to be at uh, St. Nicholas Greek Orthodox Church. Again, our chaplain, Father Di Stefano, and our president's church, Socrates Kalitsos, and their bishop, their metropolitan, Savas of Pittsburgh, which includes a large part of western Pennsylvania, Ohio, and some other areas around here, uh, talked about the uh, holy. Uh, a synod of Orthodox churches that met in Crete in 2016 and put it in context uh, talking about the first seven ecumenical councils. Again, all of that is detailed in the minutes that were published. If you didn't get them and want them printed out, uh, I'll do that for you. See me or give me your email and we'll send it to you. So other than that, uh, are there any questions? Okay. Um, oh, yes. And the treasurer has given me the current figure, which is $1,029.71. His job is in jeopardy. That's down from the last time. So if you want to pay your dues, that will, that will enable Rich to Two stay in position. Two people pay dues. I'm oh. willing to take more dues. Okay. And uh, our beloved Coptic nuns never cash the checks. So. Never cash the checks. Never check. cash the checks. Well, see, writing that signature in Arabic, they're still trying to figure it out. <laughs> it's their native language, but the way you wrote it, they, they, they don't know what it is. Okay, just kidding. Anything else? Is there any old business? Any new business? The next section is announcements, and then we will go on to our speaker of the evening. Uh, announcements, I'll take the the opportunity to say that July 11th, 12th, 13th, and 14th, St. Nicholas Greek Orthodox Church is holding their 35th Greek Summer Fest at our church, which is right across from Chauvin. Now, I know that Mount Carmel has something, so if there's any other announcements, please somebody stand and make the announcement because we like to attend each other's churches and their functions. I have a brief announcement, Mr. President. Go ahead. Where did it go? There it is. Please. Okay, it's, it's booting up. Um, we'll announce this when he's present next time, but our ecumenical officer for the Roman Catholic or, uh, Diocese of Youngstown, Father Joseph Whitmer, received a, an ecumenical award. He's been involved in ecumenical dialogue and relations. My screen just went blank. I was going to read it to you. Uh, for 48 years. 48 years. And he started 1971. So he's been doing this. He was involved in, uh, at the national level in Washington, D.C. for the National Conference of Catholic Bishops. Now it's called the USCCB. Um, dialoguing with the Oriental Orthodox. Okay? And now he's involved with our group. He's been involved with our group, a very faithful member. And he's retired and he's been part of the Lutheran dialogue, Lutheran Catholic dialogue too. So Father Whitmer is a seasoned ecumenist. He's been involved for many, many years. And um, when you see him, probably hopefully at our next meeting, you know, please go up and congratulate him. 48 very dedicated, solid years of ecumenical dialogue with a host of different people, even some inter-religious inter dialogue with uh, people of other faiths. So, Father Joseph Whitmer, the Thomas Fitzgerald Ecumenical Award, 48 years. Thank you. Any other announcements, please? 
Uh, the Our Lady of Mount Carmel Festival in Youngstown is July 25th, 26th, 27th, and 28th. Uh, so, you know, it's a wonderful family-oriented festival, good food, good times. Any other announcements? The Youngstown, Greater Youngstown Italian Fest is the following week, uh, early August, in downtown Youngstown. So, for those of you who haven't become Italian yet, you have an opportunity to become an honorary Italian. Hey, Mr. President, I think you have some Italian blood. I, well, I <laughs> never knew that until I had my DNA done. Yeah. And 65% of me How is uh, Greek and Italian. Okay. So, uh, And I've been on the committee since they started, so we'll leave it at that. It's in your uh, DNA. Who is giving the uh, introduction of our lecture speaker? It's yours. Okay. Okay, last year at this time we were also privileged to have uh, Father Fisher come and actually he did four different presentations, I believe, two different ones in Pittsburgh and two other unique presentations here at St. Mary. So uh, once again his travels brought him our way and tonight Father Fisher uh, will be addressing finding the Trinity in the Old Testament. He'll give the same talk tomorrow night, uh, again at our Maronite Parish, Our Lady of Victory in, in Pittsburgh. Um, Father Fisher is somebody we've really come to uh, uh, know and love here in, in Youngstown. Uh, I think probably the first time I met him must have been at the, perhaps the Feast of the uh, Assumption when many of our priests of the Dormition when we go out here to the National Shrine. But um, Father David is no, no stranger to Youngstown. Uh, he was ordained in Rome, I believe in 1983, by again St. Pope John Paul II. And uh, it was in Rome at the, uh, while studying there in the Gregorian University, I believe he met uh, Gregory McMansour, who is now one of our bishops. He's the bishop of the I-95 Diocese. That's the East Coast. Uh, which is headquartered in, uh, in Brooklyn. And through their, their friendship, uh, Father David came in, into the Maronite Church, and we're very, very grateful for that. Father David's not only been a priest, he's an academic. Uh, those of you that uh, saw the flyer that was sent out know that he's taught in a lot of places, especially here in Ohio. I believe Father is originally from Columbus. Right. So. Uh, in, in between doing five different liturgies down there, I heard uh, in the span of a couple of days, he uh, also got to see his, his brother. Um, in all those flyers, I was trying to get his credentials uh, properly stated. And, and Father really doesn't care, but just so you know, he has all the sacred degrees from the uh, Pontifical Gregorian University. He has the STB, which is the bachelor's. He has the STL which is the licensure to teach, and he has, he has an STD. Now, nowadays, that sounds bad, but it's the equivalent of a PhD in sacred uh, theology. So finally, I, I, think, uh, I think I got it right. And I know uh, Father is uh, somebody, well, I know the first time I met you, you came and actually subbed here, Father. For Father Salem. Yes, for, 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 for Father Anthony Salem. Uh -huh. And uh, I was so refreshed to get a, a, a homily that actually had some some history behind it, and uh, I, I, I just enjoyed the heck out of it and said, I'm going to have to get to know this priest. So I hope you'll get to know him this evening. I'm sure as he talks about defining the Trinity in the Old Testament, he'll put a little bit of an Eastern slant on it, and uh, without anything more, Father Fisher. Pass out uh, my lecture so you can follow along.
want to thank Ray for having me back and Core Bishop Kale for putting me up and uh, Socrates. Can't go wrong with that name. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Before I begin, I wanted to ask you to pray for something that was very disturbing I read today. <clears throat> a judge in Great Britain decided that a woman had to have an abortion. She was a young Nigerian woman, a British citizen I assume. <clears throat> and, uh, she has described as mildly severe autism. And her mother said that she would raise the child. And the judge, who was a woman, said, uh, this girl wants to have a baby because she th can think of it as no more than getting a new doll. And her mother isn't capable financially of raising a child. So they're actually forcing her to have an abortion. So please keep them in your prayers. When I studied at the Gregorian, <clears throat> I had the great opportunity of taking a course from John Zizulos. At that time, he was still a professor at Gla in Glasgow not yet ordained, and uh, his lectures were packed, and he so greatly influenced all of us and opened our minds to the Eastern tradition. And uh, then in my further studies, um, I've been very much influenced by many Eastern theologians, especially Shmaimon. Okay. I know we have questions at the end, but this te the teacher in me tells me um, if you have any points of clarification while we're going through this, please stop me. I'd rather clear up anything that you might not get then wait till the end. First I have uh, two quotes. First from St. Gregory the Theologian. Above all, guard for me this great deposit of faith for which I live and fight, which I want to take with me as a companion, and which makes me bear all evils and despise all pleasures. I mean the profession of faith in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I entrust it to you today. Then from St. Ephraim, the Syrian scripture brought me to the gate of paradise and the mind stood in wonder as it entered. There is only one God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Joseph, the God of the Panagia Theotokos, Peter and Andrew, Jesus Christ, the eternal word of the Father, made flesh, reveals the nature and very, very being of God as Holy Trinity. The power of the Holy Spirit sent by the Father, we are able to profess that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In that same power, we profess that the Church is one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. One holy God. A trinity of persons and perfect ontological communion. One holy church. A multitude of persons in perfect ontological unity. As the nature and being of God cannot be altered or changed, so also the nature and being of the church cannot be altered or changed. Even if the visible unity of the church appears to be fractured, this is true only to the extent that human weakness and sin can cast doubt and confusion upon individuals.
For in its essence, the body of Christ cannot be divided. The renowned Orthodox liturgical scholar Alexander Schmemann remarked that the church is not a library of doctrines that have been neatly cataloged into individual classifications. Neither is it the strict sense of the word a teacher of religious truths. Rather, it is an epiphany of God's final and total revelation to humanity. When we ask how the church can be a beacon which draws all men and women into the light of Christ to discover in faith the great epiphany of God's final and total revelation, our answer must first involve overcoming the great scandal of visible separation. How can we recapture in our time the unity and diversity that existed in the first millennium of Christianity? And like the fathers of the church, be able to express the essential truths of the faith in different languages and cultures while retaining the bond of visible communion. This is our calling, our mission, and our hope. One holy God, one holy church. A study of the Old Testament, the Holy Trinity in the Old Testament, involves much more than reciting passages of sacred scripture where there seems to be a recognition of the triune nature of God, or the activity of one or more of the persons of the Trinity in particular passage. First, we must be careful in reading into the Old Testament our Christian understanding of God. If we are looking to uncover what is in the mind and intention of the inspired Jewish writer and the people for whom they wrote. Second, we would diminish the importance of the incarnation of the Word made flesh, Jesus Christ, if we were to posit that the fullness of Trinitarian faith was present and available to the chosen people of the Old Testament. Third, within the context of sacred scripture, when dealing with the Old Testament, we are confronted with many centuries of human history, many centuries of oral traditions that become eventually written down, and many centuries of redacting of those writings, often in light of their present situation and dominant religious perspective. By comparison, the New Testament gives us a much more manageable time frame and a more focused environment to place under our biblical theological microscope. This takes us to the heart of our endeavor, which is not a matter of searching for explicit references to God as Holy Trinity in the Old Testament. For while some may answer that there are, most contemporary exegetes of sacred scripture would say there are not. Rather, we must keep in mind that there is only one God. And for us who profess Christian Trinitarian faith, we understand that while the fullness of this nature may have not as yet been veiled, would have, excuse me, may have been as yet veiled to the chosen people of Israel, it is the Holy Trinity who moved and inspired Abraham, Moses, David, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and the people of the Old Testament church, to use the theological perspective of the holy evangelist, Luke. The Catechism of the Catholic Church offers the following insight. The Trinity is a mystery of faith in the strict sense. One of the mysteries that are hidden in God, which can never be known unless they are revealed by God. To be sure, God has left traces of his Trinitarian being in his work of creation and in his revelation throughout the Old Testament. But his inmost being as Holy Trinity is a mystery that is inaccessible to reason alone or even to Israel's faith before the incarnation of God's Son and the sending of the Holy Spirit. The Septuagint. Often called the Alexandrian version, the Septuagint is the only Greek translation from its possibly seven or more translations to survive completely. 
written most likely in the third century before Christ in Alexandria, Egypt, by order of the Greek ruler of Egypt, King Ptolemy II. The official title in the Koine or Kine common Greek of the time is the translation of the 70. The title Septuagint coming from the Latin title given to the word Septuaginta because it was thought to have been translated from the Hebrew by 70 Jewish scholars. The Septuagint is considered by the Eastern Orthodox Church to be the official and inspired version of the Jewish scriptures or Old Testament. It has significantly been used throughout history in translations of the Old Testament and in many instances employed texts from the most ancient Hebrew biblical sources. This has been substantiated by the findings at Qumran, known as the Dead Sea Scrolls, that the manuscript sources of the Septuagint predate those of the Masoretic text, which is considered today as more or less the official Hebrew scripture by many in Judaism. The New Testament church received the Old Testament or Jewish scriptures primarily in the Greek of the Septuagint. And until St. Jerome was called upon by the Pope of Rome to create a new and improved translation of the scriptures in Latin, the famous Vulgate, or Common Latin Translation, both Western and Eastern Christianity accepted the Septuagint as the standard Old Testament text. From the perspective of ecumenical dialogue, there is a need to take into consideration how the Septuagint has influenced Orthodox belief in life. In the Catholic tradition, the Latin Vulgate held sway over Catholic Old Testament devotion and scholarship until the encyclical of Pope Pius XII, the Vino of Lante Spiritu of 1943, which called for new translations into the vernacular languages based upon the most available ancient sources. While positive in its outlook and forethought, this often meant overlooking the Greek Septuagint for the most ancient Hebrew manuscripts of the Old Testament. The icon of the hospitality of Abraham. There is an old adage in English that a picture is worth a thousand words. While no picture can produce more meaning than the words of sacred scripture, one of the greatest visible images reflecting the words of scripture is that of the old Holy Trinity by the Russian iconographer Andrei Rublev. This masterpiece of art and spirituality is also known as the Hospitality of Abraham and was completed in either 1411 or between 1425 and 1427. The scriptural reference is Genesis 18, 1 to 8. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oak of Mamre as he sat in the entrance of his tent while the day was growing hot. Looking up, he saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the entrance of the tent to greet them. And bowing to the ground, he said, Sir, if it please you, do not go on past your servant. Let some water be brought, that you may bathe your feet, and then rest under the tree. Now that you have come to your servant, let me bring you a little food, that you may refresh yourselves, and afterward you may go on your way. Very well, they replied, do as you have said. Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, Quick! Three measures of bran flour, knead it and make bread. He ran to the herd, picked out a tender choice calf, and gave it to a servant who quickly prepared it. Then he got some curds and milk as well as the calf that had been prepared, and set these before them, waiting on them under the tree while they ate. Genesis 18, 1 to 8. Philip Kozlowski, writing in Altea, offers a very succinct introduction to the theology of this icon. 
is most absurd and improper in icons, to depict in icons God the Father, the gray beard, and the only begotten Son in His bosom with the doves between them, because no one has seen the Father according to His divinity, and the Father has no flesh, and the Holy Spirit is not an essence a dove, but an essence God, from the great synod of Moscow in 1667. For the Russian Orthodox Church depicting the Holy Trinity in art has been an issue of controversy for the past thousand years. Even though the Council of Nicaea in 787 permitted the artistic representation of God, the Russian Orthodox Church was unhappy with the popular images of God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. They felt the gray-bearded man and the dove could not do justice to the unfathomable mystery of the triune God. In place of these widespread images of God, they chose to use Andrei Rublev's Trinity icon as the proper way to depict the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Russian icon is hard to grasp for those outside the Orthodox tradition. At first glance, it doesn't appear to represent the Holy Trinity. The central scene of the icon comes from the book of Genesis. When Abraham welcomes three strangers into his tent. Rublev's icon depicts the scene with three angels, similar in appearance, sitting around a table. In the background is the house of Abraham, as well as an oak tree that stands behind the three guests. While the icon depicts this scene in the Old Testament, Rublev to use the biblical episode to make a visual representation of the Trinity that fit within the strict guidelines of the Russian Orthodox Church. The symbolism of the image is complex and is meant to summarize the Church's theological beliefs in the Holy Trinity. First of all, the three angels are identical in appearance, corresponding to the belief of the oneness of God in three persons. However, each angel is wearing a different garment, bringing to mind how each person of the Trinity is distinct. The fact that Rublev depicts the Trinity using angels is also a reminder of the nature of God, who is pure spirit. The angels are shown from left to right in the order that we profess our faith in the creed, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The first angel wears a blue undergarment symbolizing the divine nature of God and a purple <coughs> outer garment pointing to the Father's kingship. The second angel is the most familiar as he is wearing the clothes typically worn by Jesus in traditional iconography. The crimson color symbolizes Christ's humanity, while the blue is indicative of his divinity. The oak tree behind the angel reminds us of the tree of life in the Garden of Eden, as well as the cross upon which Christ saved the world from the sin of Adam. The third angel is wearing a blue garment for divinity, as well as a green vestment over the top. The color green points to the earth and the Holy Spirit's mission of renewal. Green is also the liturgical color of Pentecost in the Orthodox and Byzantine tradition. The two angels on the right of the icon have a slightly bowed head toward the other, illustrating the fact that the Son and the Spirit come from the Father in the center of the icon is a table which resembles an altar. Placed on the table is a golden bowl or chalice that contains the calf Abraham prepared for his guests. And the central angel appears to be the blessing of the meal. All of that combined reminds us of the sacrament of the Eucharist. While not the most direct representation of the Holy Trinity, it is one of the most profound visualizations ever produced. It remains in the Orthodox and Byzantine traditions the primary way to depict the triune God. The icon is even held in high esteem in the Roman Catholic Church and is frequently used by catechists to teach others about the mystery of the Trinity. The Trinity is a mystery and will always be so while we are on earth. However, sometimes we are given glimpses into God's divine life and Rublev's icon allows us a brief second to peek under the veil.
It is significant to note that Rublev chose to make his mystical theological point about the trinitary nature of God using the first book of the Old Testament and the father of faith, Abraham. In doing so, he teaches us that the triune God is present in the faith of Abraham, if in a veiled manner, and therefore at the very beginning of the Judeo-Christian tradition. It also conveys the message that the presence of the one God is always the presence of the Holy Trinity wrapped in glory. Comprehended as mystical truth, with the Father eternally revealing himself in the Son and Spirit, thus the hypostatic nature of God is love. The Old Testament understanding of God. There's a great cultural leap between the people of ancient Israel and the fathers of the councils of Nicaea and Constantinople that formed the Nicene Constantinopolitan symbol of faith. What they hold in common is the faith experience of a personal relational God. While ancient Israel drew upon the languages and cultures that comprised the ancient Near East, the fathers of the church drew upon the philosophical language of Greco-Roman philosophy. Although, to some degree, the Syriac fathers shared in the poetic culture cultural expressions of the Jewish people and therefore give expression to Trinitarian faith in non-Greco-Roman philosophical language. John Mackenzie writes, Israelite thought in the biblical era lacked the discursive reasoning developed by Greek philosophy and was incapable of general and abstract speculation. In Hebrew, to know God is to encounter a personal reality, and a person is not known unless his name is known. In Hebrew, speech, there is a peculiar association of the person and the name foreign to our idiom. Name is used in context where modern languages use as person or self. To have no name is to have no existence in reality. When one's name is blotted out, one ceases to exist. To give a name is to confer identity and not merely to distinguish from other individuals or species. When God creates, he gives a name to each object, object of his creation. Hence, the knowledge of God is disclosed in his name. As the Israelites moved from henotheism, the worship of one deity without the explicit denial of the existence of other deities, to strict monotheism, we encounter in the text of scripture, scripture many names and titles for God. Elohim, often translated as kurios in Greek, is actually a plural word that was usually regarded as being singular when referring to the God of Israel. Although used by the Israelites in its plural meaning when referring to the gods of other peoples or even angels. The exact meaning of the word is not certain, although power seems to be the most likely meaning, especially if understood as the power of being holy, which Rudolf Otto explained as meaning holy other in comparison to other beings. God reveals his name to Moses, his name being Yahweh, a name for the deity or divine not found anywhere else in the ancient world. The name was so holy for the Israelites that it was not used in a manner by which it could be trivialized or erased. So it was often replaced by another descriptive word for God and not written where it might be erased. The idea of the nature of God as being Trinitarian would have been almost impossible throughout the most throughout most of the history of the Israelite Jewish people during the Old Testament period. What they did have faith in was the God who was active in their lives, the God who had chosen them for a unique purpose among all the peoples of the world. They understood that God was personal, relational, ruler and creator of the universe, and that he would redeem them and save them. The Old Testament speaks both of the spirit of Yahweh and the word of Yahweh, 
Both are seen as impersonal powers of God that go forth from God and do His will, especially seen in the mission of the prophets of Israel and Judah. Some passages. Genesis 1.1 1, 1. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was above upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. Genesis 1.26 Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Genesis 11, 6, 7. And the Lord said, Behold, there are one people, and they have all one language. And there's only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down, and there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. 1 Samuel. And Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward, and Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Daniel 7. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages would serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that will not be destroyed. Conclusion, ecumenical convergence. John Romanides, in the empirical dogmatics of the Orthodox Church, offers a brief explanation of how the Orthodox Church has viewed the unity of sacred scripture. The word testament denotes someone's will, which is recorded and confirmed by his signature. In both testaments, the second person of the Holy Trinity appeared to the prophets and apostles. The revelation was granted to them. An agreement was made and it was sealed with the blood of sacrifice in the Old Testament and the blood of Christ in the New Testament. We therefore study the Old and New Testaments using the interpretive keys given by the prophets, apostles, and fathers as preserved within the church. The Holy Fathers of the Church did not see the Old Testament and New Testament divided into law and grace, but from the perspective of the stages of perfection. Another serious issue is that Western, Roman Catholic, and Protestant theologians support the view, as we see in Barlaam, that divine manifestations in the Old Testament are transitory. They are different from the theophanies of the New Testament. The Holy Fathers of the Church did not hold such views. In, characteristic, in this characteristic that St. Ambrose, Bishop of Milan, whose teaching is the same as the Eastern Fathers, guided Augustine to prepare himself prior to baptism by reading the Old Testament. Romanides points to the historical theological difference of how the relationship between the Old and New Testaments have been viewed in Eastern and Western Christianity. He also shows, using the conversion of Augustine and the instructions of Ambrose, how the West in the patristic period shared the same sense of the unity of the Testaments as the East also held. Unfortunately, under the influence of medieval scholasticism, a type of disjoining of the Old and New Testaments emerged in Western Christian thought. In Roman Catholic theology today, there has been a return to a theological sense of the unity of sacred scripture. The Second Vatican Council and De Verbum taught God, the inspirer, and author of both testaments, wisely arranged that the New Testament be hidden in the Old, and the Old be made manifest in the New. For though Christ established the New Covenant in His blood, Still, the books of the Old Testament, with all their parts, caught up into the proclamation of the gospel, acquire and show forth their full meaning in the New Testament, and in turn shed light on it and explain it. 
We also find in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, different as the books which comprise it may be, Scripture is a unity by reason of the unity of God's plan by which Jesus Christ is the center and heart open since his Passover. Jesus Christ is the unity of sacred scripture, for it is revealed by him and is about him. In like manner, Jesus Christ is the unity of the church. It is his visible body in the world. By the power of the Holy Spirit, may we continue in our ministry of repairing the visible unity of Christ's holy church. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Yeah, I have a question. Is, sure. the, is there uh, any research done on the Trinity and the Deuterocanical books versus the, you know, the I guess what would be called the Taba? So um, we saw some instances in Genesis in your research. But what about like Maccabees? I think what you find in the Deuterocanonical books is often a more understanding and possibly even influence of Greek philosophy. Um, again, for a Jewish person to speak of God as Trinity would have been polytheism. So there could not have been an explicit understanding of the triune God. And to preserve the significance of Jesus, there could not be an understanding of the Trinity until the Incarnation, Death and Resurrection, and Pentecost. But the point you make is well taken that in the Deuterocanonical books, for example, let's take the Book of Wisdom, compared to Genesis. Genesis. In Genesis, the creation story is obviously the Jewish people dealing with the religions of the peoples around them who are polytheistic and usually dualistic. The good God created good things and the bad God created bad things and so forth. Whereas in wisdom, wisdom speaks about creation, but it doesn't go into uh, all, all the things that Genesis does, but rather speaks of creation as coming from the wisdom, wisdom of God. Did that answer your question? <laughs> so, I guess, I guess I didn't think about that. The Deuterocanical books uh, have somewhat basis in the Greek philosophy rather than just kind of this uh, inductive thinking from the Torah. I mean, it's, it, it approaches... Is it, is it true that the Deuterocanical books are based on Greek philosophy? I would not say based on Greek philosophy. I wouldn't say that. Okay. But they have been exposed by that time to Greek philosophy. And part of what they have to address is the surrounding Greek culture around them that Alexander right. created. In the beginning, you mentioned the prophet Joseph as the god of the, and I'm sorry if I'm going to botch this a little, the Vigia Oikokok. Is that more of like an Eastern Orthodox title? All Holy Mother of God. Okay. or what scripture verse you have referenced is 1 Samuel 16, 13. Quote, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him and missed his brothers and the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David that's day four and Samuel rose up and went to Ram. Now, is spirit, is this is a uh, veiled reference to the Trinity as far as the spirit of the Lord is supposed to be the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit? Or, yes, I think the, as, a Christ, as, a, as Christians we would see, see that that way, you know. and also David. David is at times a messianic figure. Um, 
I mean, we have, we have every right as Christians, in a sense, to see, to see the workings of the Trinity in the Old Testament. That's one thing. But the other question is, if we try to say that the Jewish people saw the Trinity, that's, that's impossible. So, Father, if I hear what you're saying, we rest our faith on the Word, Jesus Christ, revealing who God is and the beautiful prayer He gives us in the Our Father. He says, I and the Father are one. He who sees me sees the Father. And then He promised to send the Spirit. And the church reflected on that with the help of the Spirit to not fall into polytheism or tritheism. But what did Jesus mean by what He said when He spoke so intimately about the Father and so personal about sending the Advocate, the Spirit? I think that's the challenge. That, I mean, to digest that, I mean, it took centuries. But we still believed, we still had the Trinity. I mean, the Trinity had us. Yeah. Um, it rests on Jesus. Mm -hmm. It rests on Jesus. All of Scripture is about Jesus. Moses talked about Jesus. David talked about Jesus. Isaiah and Jeremiah talked about Jesus. Did they consciously know that? No. Probably not. But they were moved. I wonder how how conscious we are as yeah. Christians of yeah. you know, this mystery. I like uh, the theology of John Baer. John Baer is a theologian at St. Vladimir's Orthodox Theology School in Yonkers. And he makes the point that we tend to think of salvation history, if you will, from God created men and women. Oops, they sinned. <laughs> <laughs> and so God gives them a law, and God sends them prophets, and God tries to make them good, good boys and girls. And so then he sends Christ, you know, and then the church is formed, the councils of the first millennium to, to speak about what Trinity and Christ, the new two natures of Christ and so forth. And then we go on to the end. And what Bear says, which I think makes a lot of sense, he says salvation history should begin with a circle. And in that circle is scriptures, and Christ. Salvation history begins with scriptures and Christ. First of all, by scriptures, the Old Testament. Because the Old Testament is a proclamation of who Christ will be for, for, for us who believe. You know? Then Christ, Christ enters into our way of being, our life, the Word becomes flesh, he is born of a virgin. He dies on the cross. Sent, the Holy Spirit is sent. And the church, the church is formed. And the church has a mission to bring Christ to the world. You know? So, because if you don't look at it that way, then you would be saying that God made a mistake in creation. Oops, God made humans. He made something in His image and likeness, and they sinned. God made a mistake. No. From God's eternal plan of salvation is that the Word would become flesh. But the Word had to become flesh in the history of a particular people who prepared the way for him. 
as Baird, as Baird said, he says, he says, if there were not the Jewish people and their calling to create a scripture, and you pass Jesus Christ in a coffee shop, would you know who he is? No. We know who Jesus is because of the scriptures. He, he has a context when he enters into our history because of the scriptures. And I think that's why Luke, Luke always tries to tie together the Old Testament and New Testament. And he basically sees the church as beginning with the Jewish people and coming to fulfillment in Christ. Great. There's a question out there. I think we'll go first. <clears throat> My question is, we refer to the second person of the Trinity, mm -hmm. born of the Father before all ages. You know, Jesus is the name when the Word becomes flesh and enters history. Then we have Jesus. Prior to that, there's not some little Jesus floating around. There's the Word. Literally, literally, when God thinks or speaks, mm -hmm. let there be light. We say, through him all things were made. Those thoughts, those words, in maybe that's how we're made in the image of God, that we use these ideas articulated to communicate. Is, is, is that who Jesus is? The literal word, thought, mind of God. Yes, I would agree with that. But I, I also like the way that fathers of the church often explain how we are made in the image of God. And they said because we're made trinitarian. We have a body, a soul, and a spirit. And our body is not our flesh. St. Paul makes that distinction. That our sarks, our flesh, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Our body is our personal identity. He will always be you. And therefore, body body has a metaphysical, is elevated to a, a metaphysical reality that preserves the personal identity of all of us. Unlike when the church had to deal with Neoplatonism, and Platonism with the idea that when you die, you went down the river Styx to Hades and picked up another body and came back and lived again until you became wise like Socrates. Yeah. And our soul is our, our force of life, you might say, and our spirit is what allows us to be filled with God. It is our connection with God's Holy Spirit. And that's why when we profess the creed, which is not translated very well in English, but we say when the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, but it comes from a Greek word, ekporesis, which, which couldn't be translated into Latin well. They, the Latin is translated as procedere, proceeds in English. But the word actually, as it's used in the creed, <coughs> means more of the power of the Father that enters, enters us and transforms us and draws us back to the Father. It's a beautiful, dynamic understanding. We were made to be filled with God's Spirit. And the Spirit is what makes us Christ-like and draws us to the Father. Father? I, I do have a question. As, a, as we gather here as an ecumenical gathering, um, we're all Christian, and and it, it makes sense in, in many different ways that we see the whole of the context of Scripture from a Trinitarian perspective, that our whole understanding is, is fused with, with a Trinitarian um, dimension. Um, but what would you what would you suggest in terms of of interfaith dialogue with the Jewish people, what would, how would you suggest we express something of the same uh, in, in 
I think one thing, <clears throat> as Christians, we often think that Judaism is like it was when we read about it in the Old Testament. I think often uh, when, we, when we read the Jewish scriptures, we think we therefore understand what Judaism is. But we have to remember that modern Judaism is Talmudic Judaism. And that the teachings of the scriptures have been heavily influenced by the Palestinian and Babylonian Talmuds when these rabbis you know, gave explanations and stories. And so modern Judaism tends to be what we would call Talmudic Judaism, at least Orthodox Judaism. Reformed Judaism is kind of like Unitarian Christianity. But um, so I think that's the first thing to keep in mind that we really have to appreciate how Judaism actually works today. That just reading the Old Testament doesn't tell us how Judaism is today. Um, but I think, again, though, we do have some common points we can draw out common understandings about God, that God is love, that God, God, is, God will bring a, a, a saving fulfillment to his creation. Um, I think for the Jewish people, they often, you know, they feel as if they suffered a lot under, under Christian rulers and they don't trust us maybe. But um, um, so I think again, I think that the only way any of us can have dialogue is to try to find the points of convergence and the things that we share in common. And we do share a lot of things in common with Judaism. I don't know if that answered your question. If I may, one more. Um, what did Jesus tell the two disciples on the road to Emmaus? Uh, right after he resurrected, he hasn't been seen by anyone else. He was in a beard or something. They don't recognize him. And he tells them something for two hours as they're walking. And then they like understand. So presumably they understand part of the Trinity here. And he, he tells them something. I don't think he... I mean, obviously, the story is a Eucharistic story. There's not even a place called Emmaus. So it was a story that Christians were inspired to write and then for the purpose of teaching about the Eucharist. Now, when he's walking with them, I think we are to understand that he's teaching them how the personages of the Old Testament were talking about him. You know? Didn't, don't you know that Abraham was talking about me? And here's how he was talking about me. Don't you know that Moses was talking about me? And, and so when they finally get to the place and break the bread, Eucharist, he's, he's gone, but he's present. <laughs> He's gone as he was walking, but he's present in the Eucharist. So, so it's about he was talking about the second person of the Trinity, most likely. Just the, rather than the whole Trinity, it's like the second person that's the focus. I think the point is yes, that he's talking about how he is the fulfillment of the scriptures. Mm -hmm. And then and, but he's doing it like in a third person though. He's like, well, this guy who just died, mm -hmm. this is what he did, and this is what Abraham said. Because if he said, they don't know him, because they don't recognize him. Right. If he said, uh, uh, "I'm Jesus," don't you remember me? Right. He's like, well, "What do you think about what do you think about this guy who just died?" Mm -hmm. And they're like, "Well, he had so many hopes." But yeah, if he came out and said, "Well, it's me," can't you see it's me? <laughs> that would that would take away from the whole point. The whole point is his presence in the Eucharist. And how we have faith. Again, 
I think so. I think you know, when the for example, when the early fathers of the church talked about the scriptures, the apostolic fathers, they were talking about the Old Testament. When we talk about the scriptures, we think of Old Testament, New Testament. But the first Christians, I think Saint Irenaeus. Saint Irenaeus is probably the first church father to have something that we would call an Old and New Testament. So around 175. When the Apostolic Fathers and the New Testament Church talked about the Scriptures, they meant the Jewish Scriptures. And it was heretical not to have the Old Testament. Some just wanted parts of the New. Marcion, the most famous. Yeah, Marcion said that the Old Testament shows us the bad God, and Jesus shows us the good God. And so he made his own church and his own Bible. <laughs> uh, point of clarification, just from my understanding and whatever my confusion my part, but the difference between man having a soul and a spirit is what in particular I don't know. Just so I know. So if you have, if I have a soul and I have a spirit, what's the difference between well, those two considered a lot of times? people use those synonymous words. Yes, often. But I think the way the fathers understood it was our body and our soul is your identity, your personal, immortal identity. Your spirit is that part of you that makes you a vessel of God. Unlike cats or dogs or something else. You know? I, I knew there was a difference because uh, Animals have a finite or a mortal soul, whereas we have an immortal one. So I knew I just wasn't sure exactly how having the spirit played into the person having the soul. Okay. Any more questions? I think you've done a fantastic job. <laughs> I've heard much about your presentations. You have truly inspired me, and we thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Father Joseph, as chaplain, would you please come forward for a minute? This is something we probably never told you, but you close every meeting oh. with, with a prayer, and here's the prayer. Oh, and if you're not here, we can't end. <laughs> if you're able to stand for a In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. O great hierarch, John Chrysostom. Thou hast sought after love, and the same love which reconciles the divided. You have preached unto all the faithful, and expounding the words of the apostles. As for us sinners, each having our own gifts, we lack the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We are vain, provoking one another. Therefore our divided gifts come not unto peace and salvation, but rather under enmity and to our judgment. For this cause we fell down before you, O hierarch of God, in the grip of dissensions. And in contrition of heart we ask, by your prayers, drive away from our hearts all pride and envy that divide us, so that in many members there may be one churchly body. And so that according to the word of your prayer, we may love one another and in one accord confess the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Trinity, one in essence and undivided, now and ever, unto the ages of ages. Amen. Thank you, Father. We stand dismissed. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, for those who attended for the first time tonight, I hope you'll come back. That was our chapter prayer, uh, especially for members of the Society of St. John Chrysostom. Uh, take some food for the road. Bye. <laughs>